Um, before we get started, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. I'm joining uh, this call from the country of the Yugger and Terrible people in southeast Queensland, and I acknowledge their custodianship of this land for millennia. Um, for those who I haven't met yet, uh, I'm Martine Marin. I'm a Deputy Director of the Threatened Species Recovery Hub, and I'm a Professor of Environmental Management here at the University of Queensland. And I was also one of the project leaders of two TSR Hub projects that focused on um, supporting better and sort of more evidence-informed decisions around offsets for threatened species and ecological communities. And so today is an opportunity to run through um, some of the main outputs that those projects delivered. Now, while we're getting started, though, please, um, and I can see lots of people already um, jumping into the chat, please do... Um, put your, your name and your organisation and maybe the country that you're joining from in the chat so that we can see who's online. I can see there's really good representation from across door and it's really cool to see colleagues from other states and territories. Many, many people who did a huge amount of work contributing to these projects as well over the years online and have shared many fantastic conversations, in fact, going back even before these projects existed. So it's really great to see your names online. I just wish I was seeing your faces in person, but one of these days, hopefully we'll achieve that. So please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, there is a huge amount to cover on this topic. Um, these projects, um, which ran over a total of about five years of the Threatened Species Recovery Hub, uh, delivered a lot of different products um, and um, decision support tools and guidance. So what we're proposing to do today is to just give you six um, bite-sized overviews of different outputs from the projects and allow plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, and then basically invite you to make contact with us so that we can set up a time for more in-depth um, briefings or discussion about any one of these um, that, that might be of particular interest. Because we could have probably used the entire block of, line, uh, of time that we've set aside to discuss just one of the topics. Um, so we're really going to keep it reasonably high level. Um, and we are also going to record today, but we are going to cut out of that recording any questions or discussion. So you can, you know, feel relaxed and free to ask any questions you like. We're just going to uh, put together a recording of our presentations to share afterwards. So you can pass that on to any colleagues who might not be able to make it, but might be interested as well. So. Um, I'm going to um, start by giving a bit of an introduction to why um, many of us online here spent so much of our uh, time during the Threatened Species Recovery Hub uh, project work on this topic of offsets. And I imagine that everybody joining today is fully aware biodiversity offsetting is um, the final step in the mitigation hierarchy. So a project that's likely to have a significant impact on some element of biodiversity um, like a threatened species or an ecological community, um, is required to demonstrate um, first attempts to avoid any impact at all, um, then to minimise um, impacts as far as possible uh, for temporary or transient impacts to, to repair, to restore those impacts. And then, only then, if there are unavoidable residual impacts at the end and are considered to be um, significant, then offsets are that final step. And offsets by definition are mechanisms that generate positive conservation outcomes that taken together with the impact, um, they uh, achieve at least a no net loss outcome for that particular biodiversity. So at least a no net loss or an improve or maintain outcome. There are lots of different ways of essentially saying the same thing, but we're not having that element of biodiversity worse off as a result of that project. And so there are a few key things about offsetting. First of all, as that definition implies, the gain or the benefit at the offset site then has to be um, equivalent, at least equivalent to the loss. So that means it has to be a benefit or a gain for the same type of biodiversity, the same, the same entity that was impacted. Um, but also that the size of that gain has to be at least as large 
as the amount of loss. And it's obviously a very simple sounding concept and it's easy to um, you know, outline the objective, but actually doing it, as you all know well, is really, really complex. So offsetting is something that um, all states and territories um, either do or are in the process of developing policy to do um, across Australia. And of course, it's really common around the world as well. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we're in a situation where there are a lot of um, good reasons why offsets are criticised. Um, and uh, that ranges from things through from the design, through implementation and monitoring and reporting and governance. So it's, it's a really systemic problem that's been reported in um, really uh, key reports such as the, the Samuel Review of the EPBC Act, um, the ANAO report um, from I think last year. So we, we know that we have a long way to go to really get offsetting systems up to scratch and delivering what they say on the box. Um, and it's not surprising that offsets um, struggle to um, get a good name for themselves, for themselves because it's an incredibly complex um, series of decisions are involved in identifying that, yes, this offset is adequate to counterbalance this particular loss. You know, we're talking about hugely complex conservation problems um, relating to, you know, thousands potentially of different types of um, matters, um, uh, different species, different ecological communities, and their threats and their responses to particular management interventions. We often just don't have really great information in a form that we need to make these decisions very well. And they often have to be made in a really time constrained way. So, you know, the, the people you'll hear from today and um, uh, another, uh, quite a few people who are also online but, but not speaking today, this, this crew of people has been working with, uh, with DOOR and with state agencies in particular to sort of continue the development of, of guidance that supports um, better offset um, decisions. And by better, we mean offset decisions that are more likely to achieve that no net loss outcome that are more consistent, you know, from decision to decision so that different proponents for a similar impact are doing a similar sort of thing um, to redress that impact, um, you know, that are more robust to the sorts of uncertainties and risks that are involved and that are more transparent because um, doing offsets well can be really, really expensive. And so if you're investing in doing an offset, you, you know, you want it to be clear that, that this is achieving the gain needs to be achieved. So there were two main offsets focused projects in the TSR hub over the years. So the main um, one that ran for about five years is project 5.1 better offsets for threatened species. And this um, link, um, uh, which will be circulated to everybody um, in the when we share the slides, this link takes you to the uh, project page and you can see all the resources there. So you can access everything we're talking about today from that page. But a bit of a summary of some of the things that this project um, produced. Um, so early on, there was a piece of work that we did after um, engaging particularly with people within DOOR to identify some of the key gaps and challenges around um, achieving good offsets. I've got a little bit of echo there, so it's possible somebody might need to mute, sorry. Um, and then we developed, um, so one of the major tasks of the project was to develop a set of guidelines that could be used to um, elicit from experts estimates of how much offset benefit you might get from a particular action. And Megan, uh, who led that work, is going to talk about that um, today. Um, and uh, we also did a whole suite of different um, benefit summaries because we used case studies to sort of develop and refine the guidance, the, the approach that we developed. And so Tita Nu is going to talk about that um, and give a bit of a summary of some of the key things that we um, that we found by going through this process with some species experts. Um, we also developed guidance around, you know, some particular um, uh, aspects that are quite important in the um, EPBC Act Offsets Assessment Guide, but actually as a concept are generally important elements of biodiversity offsetting. So, for example, the piece of work that Megan's actually going to speak about next, identifying what is the risk of loss of the site so that if we protect it, we can say we've averted that loss. So how much benefit do we get from protecting something? Um, how do we align um, offset requirements? Oh, so this is another piece of work that you hear about from Jeremy Simmons later on. How do we actually align the outcome of offsetting 
um, with a conservation target might be a positive outcome. So doing better than just no net loss relative to whatever's happening now. There's also a piece of work which we aren't talking about today, um, but that's currently sort of under review that was led by Haney Quiller, um, who worked on, with some door staff actually, a, a paper describing the elements of a transparent um, best practice public offset register. So we're going to share that as soon as that's available. And then there was another project which we developed towards the end, and it was more about a synthesis piece of work. So there were a couple of additional pieces of work we did here. And um, the main one, I guess, is a series of videos. And um, the, uh, the, these are like animated videos that just basically describe some of the key concepts in biodiversity offsetting uh, with incredible um, animation and design by Zoe Stone, who's online at the moment. I'm going to talk about those at the end and point you to where they are. Um, but also, uh, Helen um, Mayfield is going to describe another piece that we did to try to get our head around working out, well, we can, we can count habitat, we can count numbers of frogs, what is it that we should be counting? What is the currency that we want to use in any given situation for um, counting losses and gains for different species? Oh yeah, and this is what the videos look like, sorry. So the, the team doing this was huge. Um, there was a huge number of people involved, um, including a lot of key people working within DOOR, within state agencies and beyond. Um, the people behind the research we're going to talk about today are mostly uh, pictured on this slide. So Megan Evans, Tita Nu, uh, Jeremy Simmons and Helen Mayfield, you'll hear from in a minute. Uh, Zoe Stone is here um, online um, and you'll sort of hear from her in spirit because we're going to um, show you what the incredible videos she put together look like. Um, but I really want to recognise other people who are involved in all of this work that we're showing today, including Fleur Masuk, um, Aslan Gordon, Aslan, I think you were online, um, Haney Kuyla, who I mentioned already, Jess Walsh, who did a lot of work around um, particularly the guidance on estimating um, benefits on the uh, estimating the cost side of it so that we could look at the relative cost effectiveness of different offsets and Erica Marshall and a whole crew of other people. So um, it's been a really pretty awesome team um, to work with over the years and I've loved it. Today, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have some short talks. Um, we're going to go straight to Megan after this and then we're going to have um, questions. So we're going to have questions in sort of three bunches. So a, a short burst of questions, ignore the actual timings. I didn't put much thought into those, but um, we're going to have um, uh, a session of questions after Megan's presentation on risk of loss, the, the um, averted loss estimation. Then we're going to talk about this work that we've done around the expert elicitation and have another set of questions. And then Helen, um, Jeremy and myself will um, give some presentations on those other components. And then we've actually got quite a long chunk of time for questions and discussion. Um, so anything more general, um, we can hold over maybe to the major question. Uh, so to the major question and answer session at the end. Um, and I really want to emphasise that the point of today is so that you're aware of the range of work that we did. Um, as I say, each of them is maybe quite complex, some of them really sort of a bit conceptually tricky and could um, be the source of a really, really long discussion and detailed briefing, and we're really happy to do that. So please reach out to, to me uh, or to the individual speakers um, on the relevant topics, and we'll, we're very, very keen to set up those follow-up meetings. So with that, I'm going to unshare my screen. Oh, good. Now I can see everyone again. And I want to hand over to uh, our first speaker, Megan Evans, who I think many of you already know very well. She's collaborated with DOOR on the Offsets Assessment Guide since, I think, 2011. Um, Megan's a lecturer at the University of New South Wales based in Canberra and is a leader of a lot of the pieces of work that were done over the past years in this project. And I might also embarrass her by pointing out that she is the young, tall poppy of the year for the ACT. <laughs> Congratulations, Megan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martine. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and as Martine said, um, I guess that the purpose of this presentation, I think all of these presentations today is is a bit of a, a degustation menu kind of approach. Uh, the, you know, um, we kind of want to point you to all the various things that we did, um, but not uh, necessarily going into the amount of detail that that is needed to um, uh, really unpack uh, exactly what we did in each of these. So, um, so this this talk here, I'm hoping everyone can see my slides. Cool. Um, 
is talking about a decision tree uh, to support robust estimation of averted loss. So this is this risk of loss work that Martine mentioned. Um, the the uh, I guess um, the the title is is a is a trap because I'm not actually showing the decision tree at all. I'm just kind of pointing to the existence of it. Um, but I want to kind of yeah talk you through the rationale and and broadly what we did and uh, and also point you to where that decision tree is. And finally, just want to acknowledge that this is work that Fleur Masek led. Um, so I'm I'm here presenting really on on her behalf. Um, going back to where everything starts, and that's the policy. Uh, so uh, as Martine's uh, already defined, we all I think we all know what a, what an offset is, uh, but. I guess one of the things that, you know, coming back to when the policy was originally developed and the, and the guidance was originally developed, um, uh, the guidance, the, the offset guidance uh, calculator is there to essentially give effect to the policy principles. And so all the kind of offset calculations need to reflect what's in that policy document. Um, and in the policy document, uh, an offset uh, is defined as uh, something that delivers an outcome, a conservation outcome that improves or maintains the viability of the protected matter compared to what would have occurred under the status quo. That is, if neither the action nor the offset has taken place. That So this is this counterfactual scenario that we um, can never observe, but nevertheless, we need to estimate somehow. And this is where some of our work comes in. So this is this risk of loss component. Um, and this is this uh, component in the calculator that I'm sure all of you have have dealt with, and it's the the essentially the chance that the site will be completely cleared or completely lost, and that that gain that we um, uh, generate from averting a loss is that difference between the um, the the counterfactual scenario and the the with offset scenario. So that that the, the amount of risk that's averted is is the difference between those two values. And this is um, in this example, we've got you know four percent of the site's uh, area is is considered that that averted loss. Um, and just to kind of break that down a little bit. Um, when we're talking about conservation gains for an offset, there's actually I think this is actually a nice representation of, of the types of gain that we might get according to different types of actions. So when we're talking about risk of loss, we're actually just talking about that bottom left corner, which is the, the you know, the area, it's particularly the area component that um, is, is averted in terms of being lost. All other components that relate to condition um, in terms of your know, active management, they're dealt with in a different part of the calculator. So um, it's really just this um, uh, aversion of a loss of area that we need to think about. And they're the kinds of factors that we need to incorporate into this risk of loss calculation. So um, when we started this project, it would have been become clear that um, you know there were some issues in terms of how this this risk of loss value was being calculated. Um, I mean, one of the I guess you know obvious things that that assessment officers um, you know deal with every day is negotiation with with proponents and uh, where we have a value that can range from zero to a hundred. Um, that's a really large bounds um, of negotiation. So I guess what what our work was intending to do was to okay, can we place some perhaps some tighter bounds on what would be a plausible estimate? Um, you know, we acknowledge that there's there's still going to be this this negotiation, but if we can provide some additional additional guidance to um, clarify uh, what what these values might be in different circumstances. Uh, then that that will assist that negotiation being a bit more into the delivering better outcomes for the environment versus um, you know I guess the the natural and inevitable incentive that there is to reduce costs um, in in uh, developing offset proposals. Um, another thing that we kind of came across um, in our work as we you know, we worked collaboratively with with Door. This was around 2016, and and Fleur was leading this work. Um, 
is that there's there's all these various natural human cognitive biases that come into um, how we uh, calculate a risk of loss. And one of the ones that I want to highlight here is that uh, what's called a loss aversion bias, whereby all of us actually tend to place a higher va uh, value or a higher weight on uh, uh, averting a loss or a potential future loss versus a potential future gain. We actually um, are more concerned about losing something than we are potentially excited about gaining something equivalent. So that actually means that we actually have a, even without any kind of, you know, incentive to kind of minimise costs and that kind of thing, we actually tend to, uh, you know, if, if we're concerned about the environment, we're actually generally more worried about losing something than we are about generating or getting an equivalent gain. And that can actually have a perverse outcome in that if we, uh, est if we, you know, suggest that, well, there's a really high risk of this site being lost, we actually have a, a tendency to overestimate that risk. So um, that was yeah something that, that came out that was interesting as we did this work. Um, I just want to highlight here that it's not just, you know, nefarious kind of reasons that this, risk, this value might be exaggerated. There's actually, you know, genuinely reasonable and good reasons too. Nevertheless, they can have some detrimental outcomes for biodiversity. Um, so as, as Martine mentioned, um, there's been a few cases where in particular the risk of loss component of the offset calculations has been uh, mentioned as needing um, some reflection and, and correction. So in particular in the ANAO audit, um, uh, pointed out some of these issues with there was a particular case study in that report where the, the risk of loss was um, estimated as much higher than what it, what it actually was. Um, a Samuel review, and this was the interim report here, also uh, made, made the, the point that um, averted loss offsets um, often don't offset the impact of development because often there's actually a net loss of habitat. And this, this occurs when this risk of loss value is actually overestimated. Um, and there's a recommendation that offsets need to primarily or include a greater focus on restoration. So less of a focus on averted loss and more of a focus on active restoration, which gets into that condition um, component of, of the offset gain. Um, and this this is a, a news article from a couple of weeks ago now, and it's not to do with the EPBC policy at all, but it's exactly the same principle. Um, this is uh, under the Emissions Reduction Fund, whereby uh, carbon credits have been um, credited for avoided loss of deforestation. Um, and some analysis that Australian Conservation Foundation and the Australian Institute did uh, essentially found that, I think there was a quote in their report, where there just simply would not be enough bulldozers available in New South Wales uh, to be able to clear the amount of vegetation that supposedly had been averted. Um, so this is you know, another example of, I guess, um, overestimation of this uh, risk of loss, and also um, the fact that a clearing permit is not a sufficient uh, credible indication of intention to clear. Um, so a lot of you deal with, you know, what kind of evidence do we need? Well, one of the, our points is that a clearing permit is not sufficient credible evidence. Um, so as I said, we, we did some workshops, we had lots of discussion with um, assessment officers and others, and we also had a look at a bunch of um, calculators that had been used um, to get an idea of the kinds of values that have been used with risk of loss. Um, so in terms of coming up with a guidance of, okay, how do we better calculate these values? Our starting point, our, our logic was going, okay, um, generally speaking, uh, history can inform the future, right? So a starting point that is, I guess, um, objective, um, credible, and could be, um, you know, conducted repeatably, so a science-based approach, is uh, data that can indicate historical rates of vegetation loss. And um, 
so we did this analysis um, and produced um, estimates at the local government area level. And this was actually the data that we used was uh, so woody vegetation only. Um, and it's probably, I think when we did that analysis, it was probably wood of, woody vegetation background. I think it was maybe 2014, 2015 data. So um, it probably needs to be you know, updated, we kind of were clear when we did it that this is this is a first cut. Um, it also lumps all vegetation types together. It doesn't exclude regulated impacts. And because it's woody vegetation, it, it doesn't include things like grassland. That being said, um, one of our other points is that, well, uh, yes, our, our estimates might have been a bit different if we included things like grassland. A lot of the time, grassland is already um, uh, protected under the EPBC Act. So you can't just use that background uh, estimate as a vegetation loss. You also need to factor in whether or not an impact uh, would actually require an offset as well. So um, that's, that's so I'll, I'll revisit in a sec. So here's what the annual uh, average rates of loss uh, look like. Um, so this is an average annual rates of loss by local government area. And um, you know, this is all in the report and the fact sheet, et cetera. So I'll just kind of draw your attention to the fact that right down the bottom, the, the highest average annual rate of loss by local government area is less than 1%, okay? Um, and then when you multiply that by 20 years to get the the summed risk of loss over 20 years, which is the maximum um, uh, time that we consider under the EPBC policy, the maximum value is 14%. Um, now, that's in stark contrast to some of the, the risk of loss values that we had come across when we were um, uh, yeah, talking with assessment officers and uh, uh, looking at some of the guidance or you know, calculators where you know, some of the risk of loss values that had been um, approved were 80, 90, 100%. So one of our key outcomes or, or um, I guess findings is that even if we just look at this first step, uh, the value of a risk of loss that is going to be credible is generally going to be a lot lower than, than what we normally used to. Um, there are other factors that we need to consider. So, for example, you know, we need to exclude um, threats that if they occurred would themselves trigger offsets. So one of our uh, points is that, uh, you know, going back to the grassland example, if, if a, 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 an event that you're factoring into in terms of your estimation of risk of loss uh, would itself require an offset, then you can't actually count that contributing to the risk of loss value because uh, they occur on both sides of the equation and it essentially means, yeah, you, you can't actually factor that in. Martine is so much better at explaining that than me, so I'm going to just pump that over to Martine because um, I, I do need to, to wrap this up. Um, Another couple of simplifying steps here. Um, as I said, there's a whole um, guidance document and decision tree that we've produced. So you can go to the, the website and download that guidance. And there's also uh, a paper um, that you can have a look at as well. Um, and I've got the links to those in a sec. I guess the, the overall uh, finding from this work is that the scope for conservation gains from averted loss offsets is actually quite limited. Um, and this is kind of echoing the findings of the Samuel review as well. Um, uh, there's actually less gain that can be achieved from averting loss than what we think. And generally offsets will actually need to focus much more on, uh, on restoration. Um, and we also have cognitive biases that actually inflate these risk of loss values. So we need to be mindful of those um, when we go about um, these estimates. So um, I'll leave that there. Um, as I said, all of these links to all the um, articles referred here are, are in the slides. And um, 
there's Martine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. We need to move on, um, but luckily we're moving straight back to Megan. So I guess what I was trying to say was taking a step back, another, this is sort of a more um, general topic of how we can actually estimate the total benefit. So now not worrying just about the risk of loss element, but that's part of the benefit. Talking about the entire, um, how, do we, how do we calculate the size of the benefit we get from different sorts of interventions we might do? and how much does that help a species? Huge task to pull evidence together for that. One option might be expert elicitation and Megan is going to tell us about it. Indeed, I, I would, as I said, well, as we discussed, like I would love to bang on about risk of loss and, and chat about, you know, the issues that assessment officers deal with um, uh, more and we can later on, but um, uh, we do need to continue with our degustation and um, uh, so this was uh, uh, this this project is well was a I guess was a, something that has has taken longer than the risk of loss project and has involved many many more people um, people came and came and went including myself um, but as as Martine said the the I guess the broad rationale was okay a lot of the time it's actually hard to estimate or to know what the benefit of an offset action might be. Um, so how do we actually make decisions when we don't have that information? And typically in uh, in conservation and, and environmental uh, issues, this uh, structured expert elicitation approaches has 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 been used in a, in a lot of circumstances. Um, so we thought, well, here's one approach that could be applied to offsets. And uh, well, let, let's just say that I think at, by the end of this project, we are uh, um, perhaps, I don't know it, what, what the word would be, but generally speaking, as with offsets, as with lots of things, it's all just a little bit harder when we, when we try to apply things to offsets. And I'll explain why here. I'm hoping that uh, you can see my slides. All right, going back to that bit in the offsets policy again, we're needing to calculate uh, what is the conservation outcome? What is the likely conservation outcome that's going to improve or maintain uh, compared to the counterfactual? And um, for a lot of uh, threatened species and communities, uh, it can be difficult to know what kind of management activities might deliver that conservation gain. And there could be a few reasons. So for example, for the Northern Quoll, um, that exists in, a, in an area where the tenure uh, issues make it actually difficult to uh, secure a piece of land uh, for protection because, you know, Pilbara is covered in mining leases and we can't actually, you know, effectively protect uh, those, those places. Um, it could be something like the Tasmanian Devil where protecting habitat isn't actually going to be the most beneficial action uh, for that species because habitat loss isn't actually the primary threat. Um, how do we uh, uh, estimate the benefit of other act actions that might more, uh, more better, more better, better benefit that species? Um, so yeah, and, and for other species, we still just don't really have a clear idea of what is the most beneficial action. So the Malifal, we still have a, a I think it's things becoming a bit more clear now and Jess Walsh might want to chime in at some point here. Um, you know, the I guess the um, the knowledge has been more well, fox control is is the most effective action, even though we've actually got little empirical evidence that that's the case. Um, maybe there are other things that we're better off doing. Um, and I guess the, the the rationale or the motivation for this work was that, well, offsets are being applied as conditions of approval quite frequently. So this is from that ANA audit, ANAO audit report again. Uh, they make up around 80% of the conditions of approval uh, for controlled actions under the Act. So we obviously need better information um, about the benefits and costs of these different actions. And we need that information now. So what we uh, uh, 
we're, we're asked to do or what we said we were going to do through this project were broadly three things. Uh, first, we need to identify what are these species, species groups and ecological communities that are most in need of better information to support offset decision making. So these are, you know, I guess generally referred to as difficult to offset um, matters. Uh, we also needed to provide, or we wanted to provide some better information on the costs and benefits of, of um, what are, well, first we need to know what are these offset activities and then can we get some quantifiable evidence of the costs and benefit of these. And we also were going to deliver a protocol to actually do this expert elicitation um, to inform offset priorities. And obviously you need to do number three to be able to do number two. So I'll be talking about that. First though, we this is actually slightly predating even the, the project. Um, there was a, I guess, a relatively informal process whereby um, I think it was primarily Martine uh, consulted widely, not just with um, DOOR or the department name prior to DOOR, um, uh, as well as our, our colleagues in state and territory environment departments. Uh, what are some of the more challenging uh, matters, species, communities that, that you come up against um, when you're trying to do uh, assessments and approvals? And um, here's some of these on, on the, the list. And from this list is where we selected case studies to develop and apply this um, expert elicitation process. And um, when we talk about expert elicitation, it's not just a, you know, call some up and say, you know, oi, what do you think is the benefit of this? Um, this, we're talking about structured, rigorous, um, transparent, repeatable approaches to eliciting quantitative estimates um, from experts. And the um, most current, I guess, iteration of these structured approaches is called the IDEA protocol. Um, uh, which um, uh, Victoria Hemming, uh, uh, formerly Melbourne Uni, um, essentially worked on a lot during her PhD. It stands for investigate, discuss, estimate and aggregate, which is broadly the steps involved in doing this elicitation. And we wanted this process ideally to be quick, accessible, repeatable and robust. Um, there's been a whole range of different formats and ways that these elicitations have occurred in conservation environment. A lot of the time they'd involve getting a whole bunch of people together physically for a workshop, which, um, you know, obviously has benefits in terms of it's easier to communicate in person. But, you know, as the last two years has demonstrated, that's often quite difficult. Um, so it was actually kind of fortunate that we <laughs> um, uh, primarily wanted to develop a, an approach that could be done remotely if needed. And we did do pretty much all of these elicitations remotely. Um, so just going through these, these steps again, um, uh, in terms of doing the elicitation, what broadly what happens is we need to, uh, first we're identifying you know, what is the species or the matter that, that we're considering, what are the, the key threats that, that this species or community deals with, what are the kinds of management actions that, that um, could deliver benefits. And then the actual elicitation process is uh, essentially recruiting uh, a collection of, of quote unquote experts, and I'm using air quotes because uh, the uh, and this is coming back to community biases again, our societal kind of norms around who is and who is not an expert uh, doesn't always align with who actually holds expertise. So typically we think of an expert as someone who is you know, a professor with many, many years of expertise. But, you know, and when we were, and all of us on the team were recruiting experts, one of the things that we did have to deal with was uh, if we were, um, you know, suggested go talk to this person, you know, they're doing their PhD on this species, they have the most up-to-date knowledge. Often some of the more uh, earlier career folks or, you know, often women would not consider themselves sufficiently an expert. So we had to kind of actively encourage them, no, no, you actually are an expert. You know, we want you to, to join this group. Um, uh, 
and I guess the 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 cool thing about this approach is that what we do is we ask um, all of these individuals to provide their individual estimates anonymously. Uh, and then, uh, then there's a discussion. So people can see these estimates, discuss them, and um, so that kind of removes some of these other kind of biases, like um, what's called a halo effect, whereby it might be a group might think if, if, if an estimate is delivered by someone and we know those estimates aren't, aren't made anonymous, then we might think, well, this person's professor, their estimate clearly has to be better than mine. So we might actually revise our estimates, even though our estimate might actually be better. So providing the estimates anonymously, discussing them, we can discuss them and actually deal with some of these um, uh, issues that might come up about why some of these estimates are better. We do a second round of estimates and then we aggregate the responses. So the, the expert elicited estimate is actually an average of all of the individual responses. And the way we ask these questions is this four step approach. Um, and this has been demonstrated in the literature as, as a way of reducing biases as well. And the way we do it is we ask for folks to provide their, their lowest pl plausible value for an estimate, what's their highest plausible value, what's their best guess, and also how confident they are. Um, and that, that allows you to get a bound in an individual um, estimate as well. So when we ask a question, these are the kinds of um, uh, results that we get. So along the x-axis are the uh, the, the individual estimates and what we do in these elicitations is we ask people to provide a, you know, a pseudonym, pseudonym um, rather than their real name. So, so their real name's not there and we're not going to deal with some of those biases there. Um, and we get the first round estimates, which are in the white, um, white circles. And then what we find once we, we first see those estimates together, we have a discussion. And then usually what we find is in round two, the estimates might change a little bit or the, the, the uncertainty bounds reduce a bit. Um, and then we take the average of that as our estimate. So that all sounds like, you know, fine. Um, but I guess, again, the, the point that we, the, the key thing that we found with offsets is that uh, there's actually a whole bunch of other steps we need to incorporate when we're talking about expert elicitation for offsets. So um, this is from, from the guidance document um, and, and we, you know, we've got that um, freely available on our website. Um, but to give you an idea, here's a, a, a set of things that we need to consider when we're developing a, a question for an expert elicitation approach. So generally what um, is done uh, with expert elicitation in, in, in other domains is we come up with a set of questions about the value of something, right? Um, but with offsets, we need to uh, we need to go over a whole bunch of other things like what is the benefit indicator? Is it uh, uh, area of habitat? Is it um, number of uh, mounds that you can detect at under the light of a full moon? Is it um, how many I don't know, farts a qual makes on, on a winter evening. You know, the, these kinds of things, we actually have a discussion about what is the most appropriate indicator for whether uh, uh, you can determine whether an action is going to um, deliver a measurable increase in the viability of protected matter. Then we need to come up with a hypothetical site so that experts can kind of situate this kind of scenario in their mind. Uh, what's the time horizon? And then to be able to estimate the benefit of an offset action, we need to go into the, the counterfactual scenario as well as the offset scenario. Because if we just have a question about what's the benefit of, um, you know, fire management for that species, that's only one side of that, that equation. We need to know uh, what is the benefit, what is the gain compared to what would happen under the counterfactual scenario. So here's um, just one question for the Northern Qual. So 
I, I won't read all of this out, um, but this gives you an idea about, I guess, you know, the amount of detail that we needed to go into. And bear in mind that a good survey is a short survey, right? You're, you're recruiting people, you know, voluntarily um, to provide their expertise, their labour time for free, essentially. They don't want their time wasted. Nevertheless, this was, according to our experts, kind of the minimum amount of information they needed to be able to give some kind of uh, defensible uh, estimate for the benefit of an offset action. So um, there was actually a whole lot of work involved in adapting a standard expo elicitation approach to estimate the costs and benefits of, of offset activities. And we've got a range of fact sheets um, that we've developed um, that, um, and, and Tita will go through some results of um, one particular case study in a moment. Um, and we did apply uh, this approach for a range of case studies. Um, just to, to end, um, take home messages. Um, yes, this is a relatively quick, repeatable, you know, defensible process. Uh, the cool thing is that uh, expert elicitation can be used for other purposes. So, for example, recovery planning. Um, but, you know, we learned a lot of things from this process in that um, it wasn't really as quick or easy as we anticipated. Um, and um, uh, a lot of our results, regardless of what species or what kind of actions we were trying to get the benefits of, the results had a lot of the time very large uncertainty bounds. And that was simply because every single expert was fairly uncertain uh, about the benefits of different actions. And that kind of reflects the overall lack of um, ecological knowledge. Um, so elicitation doesn't replace empirical data. And I guess the, the key thing is, is that uh, ideally we would be ground truthing some of these um, results as well. Um, but despite the really large uncertainty bounds, um, the results did still typically show that protection alone is not a sufficient offset, which we know already. Um, but I guess on, a, on, a, on, a, on another note, I, I think we also need to be uh, serious about, you know, a lot of the time offsets are not necessarily going to be appropriate and feasible, um, which is a, a step in the offsets policy that um, I think needs to be um, paid more attention to. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Megan. That's a fantastic overview of a vast amount of work. And I want to ask Tita to come in now to give us just a little taste of what one of these elicitations looked like and some of those key um, messages that, that we sort of got out of actually applying this method. Um, and the slides are being shared. It's working. Yeah, thanks to Tim. Oh, actually, thanks, Tita, I forgot <laughs> I haven't introduced you yet. Um, People may not yet know Tita, but she is actually um, one of the absolute powerhouses behind getting all the enormous amount of work done and pulling together the huge numbers of experts and the data from all the experts. Um, and she's not just been doing that on the offsets project, she's also been working on the CAPS projects for the hub. <laughs> so you can imagine how busy that she's been. You may have seen her present before on the feral cats. So really though, one of the key pieces of work that Tita has been coordinating is these actual case study examples. So thank you Tita for coming along and talking to us about it. Thanks Martine and thanks Megan. You've summarized it really nicely. So all I need to do is really kind of go through a case study. Um, can you flick to the next slide, please, Tim? Thanks. So as Megan mentioned, the first thing that the project team did was to go, to go through and work with some people who work on biodiversity offsets and environmental approvals to develop the list of species and species groups and ecological communities that for which biodiversity information is lacking and so therefore biodiversity offsets are difficult to work out. So this consisted of the, uh, the list that Megan showed earlier. There were 14 threatened species, three species groups, and four ecological communities. And of that list, we selected these five uh, case studies to focus on. The Mallee Fowl, Northern Quoll, Night Parrot, WA Black Cockatoos, and the Brigolo Belt Reptiles. But today I'll just focus on the Night Parrot. So if you can flip to the next slide, please, Tim. 
And I know we've got uh, Nick, one of the experts here today. So Nick, we might default to you if there's um, any tricky questions on night parrots. So the night parrot is a cryptic nocturnal bird that is endemic to the Australian inland. It used to be quite common un until about 1870 when it started to steeply decline in numbers. Uh, the key threats to the night parrot are thought to be uh, mainly inappropriate fire regimes and predation by feral cats. Uh, there was a sighting of the night parrot in 2005, which led to much excitement, but it wasn't really until 2013 that a small subpopulation was discovered in Western Queensland. And Indigenous ranger groups have subsequently found about five other sites where night parrots occur. Night parrot is listed as critically endangered in the Australian uh, Action Plan for Australian Birds, which will be released in December this year. Uh, it's thought that the decline, the species will continue to, to decline uh, and that because of all of the threats that are still in place and because the populations that do exist are really, really small. So there's limited information to inform decision making on night parrots. Uh, previous offsets have included uh, contributions towards research, but that in itself does not achieve a direct benefit. So that can't counterbalance any impacts. And you can see from the map that Nick has produced that they've got quite a potential uh, wide distribution and a lot of it is in areas which are kind of uh, of interest to developers. Next slide, please. Jim. Uh, so this kind of graph kind of summarises the application of our expert elicitation case studies. If you can just click there, Tim, that would be great. Uh, and again. So uh, as I mentioned, night parrots are continuing to decline. And if we do nothing, we call this the counterfactual or the baseline scenario, uh, then, then they'll continue to decline. And we asked experts to consider whether there's any management actions or combinations of actions that would actually lead to no net loss or an increase in the number of night parrots at a given site. And the benefit indicator that we used for the night parrots was the number of active night parrot roosts uh, defined as an area where they had been recorded consistently for, two, for a two year period. Uh, if you can just click again, Tim, and again, and again, and again. So yeah, so we were looking at, well, what actions or combination of actions could lead to that uh, no net loss, basically. And if you can just click again, it's a little bit disconcerting. Thank you, Tim. Um, we asked experts to think about, well, what are the actions that you could try and balance the, the, the potential loss of night parrots? And again, thank you. So we asked a couple of night parrot experts, one of whom is here on the call today, uh, so we can divert any tricky questions on night parrots to him. What are the management actions that could benefit night parrots? And so when we looked at feral cat control, so baiting, trapping and uh, sorry, baiting, trapping and um, what was the other one? Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Fire management and protecting habitat. Yeah, and then there was feral cat uh, control, uh, which is more intensive. We looked at whether indigenous hunting and felixes could be used, but we only considered that over one round. Um, fire management uh, particularly applied so that uh, the, the burns were patchy and that the spin effects that in which they live and the food sources on which they depend could be better protected. Uh, feral fox control, uh, shooting was the other one, baiting, trapping and shooting. So again, for feral fox control, those were the three methods we, that we asked people to consider. And then for uh, we also asked experts to consider the option of restoring degraded land through uh, cessation of grazing and basically minimising dingo persecution and exclusion fencing and then protecting habitat was through formal protection by des designation as a protected area. Uh, again, cessation of grazing and general fire and weed management as well as minimising the persecution of dingoes. Uh, next one please Tim. So if we go to the results, so the circles indicate the aggregated group 
estimates over two rounds of expert elicitation, and the diamonds show the range of uh, uncertainty associated with those uh, estimates. And if we look at the, uh, the results in more detail, we can see that the combination of actions, so protection of habitat combined with control of cats and foxes and the management of fire resulted in what thought was thought to be the greatest benefit for night parrots, but that the uncertainty was really high. And then if you look at the degraded potential habitat, you can see that, well, experts didn't seem to think that for night parrots, it was uh, it would necessarily match anything that you could do in current night parrot habitat. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. So reiterating uh, what Megan said earlier, uh, limited empirical data for species like the night parrot means that there's high uncertainty around the expert estimates on these things. And a common theme that emerged across all of our case studies was that a combination of best practice and intensively applied management actions resulted in the greatest gain for threatened species. And that was common across all the groups that we did. So it's like Megan said, it's not a perfect tool. It can be one that can be used to inform conservation decision making, but it does have its limitations. And thank you. That was the end. And oh, thanks, Tim, for driving the show. <laughs> yes, thank you, Tim, behind the scenes. And thanks, Tina. That was awesome. First of all, I want to introduce Helen Mayfield. Helen is um, going to talk a bit about a cool decision tree she's developed. Now, Helen's actually worked on a lot of different decision support tools, not just in the environmental area, but also on epidemiology. So just um, been probably overwhelmed with COVID related stuff in the last year, but has also managed to um, work a little bit on something else controversial offsets. Um, so this is a piece of work from the synthesis project, which focuses on how we work out what currency we should be using for counting the losses and gains. Thanks, Helen. Talk is getting good. Excellent. Thanks so much. Can you see those slides okay? Yeah, yes. all good. Lovely. So um, thanks, Martine, and thanks, guys, for the introduction so far. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the currency selection for offsets. Um, now, when we refer to offset currency, we're talking about how we quantify this gain and loss at a site. So defining exactly what is being traded in offset transaction. Um, you've heard it referred to in a couple of different ways already. So sometimes we call it the unit of measure, uh, the benefit indicator, the index, or the metric. So just as an example, um, if we have three snakes at our impact site and we have one snake at our proposed offset site, we have four snakes. However, due to some unavoidable residual loss at our impact site, maybe we lose two snakes. So we need to see a subsequent gain of two snakes at the offset site to achieve the simplest definition of known net loss, i.e. we still have four snakes like we did at the start. But perhaps we, what we actually want to measure is um, a diff something different. So maybe it's an ecological community or we're offsetting for snakes, but for some reason we can't count snakes and we need to use something different. For example, a habitat score. So we could instead count the number of hectares loss adjusted based on a quality score. So improving or creating the same amount of habitat somewhere else. Uh, in this example here, you can see that um, we're improving the four hectares at the offset site from a score of four to a score of eight. And this compensates for the loss of those two high quality hectares at the impact site. So now we're measuring this offset trade, this benefit and loss, in um, habitat quality hectares rather than in number of individuals. And there are a few caveats surrounding what currencies we can use in offset context. So um, I suppose sort of long term monitoring programs, these indicators need to be measurable in a short time frame and at a site level. We also need to be really mindful that a successful offset on paper can still have really negative outcomes for biodiversity if we're using the wrong currency. So for example, if we used the number of individuals at a site, but then they weren't on site when we went to count them, or we use a habitat quality by area score, 
but we get our scoring all wrong and we replace a really great site with a total rubbish site. So for ecological communities, um, we can use the benchmark metrics as a scoring system. So these score a site relative to a reference site, um, generally um, against what's the best on offer. And it's a well-established way of doing things. Um, not every community has a reference state yet, but in most cases, there is something you can compare it to. For species, it gets a little bit trickier, um, and there's a few different offset currencies that we can choose between. But it really boils down to that there's these two basic flavours. There's either a measure of abundance or some measure of habitat. And there's a few things to consider to help you decide which way to go. So the first of these is if you can reliably detect the species when it's on site. So you can't count something if you can't find it. For example, we can't use a measure of abundance for some orchid species that reside underground and only flower some years because we simply don't know how abundant they are. Secondly, Counting the species at a single point in time might not be meaningful if that species has substantial population fluctuations over a really short time span. So consider these boom and bust species and the difference you might get for a boom and bust species if you score um, one site during a boom and then you go back uh, during a bust or you score another site during a bust. You've got one, um, one situation, you've got a really high abundance, go back a bit later, there's nothing. It's also um, considering whether or not the species is even reliably on site can make a difference. So some species like swift parrots and regent honey eaters um, are highly mobile and only use a site sporadically. Uh, another example, the green and golden bell frogs. Um, it's a species that will find an absolutely fantastic site, then only, then only sort of use it now and then. Finally, um, you can't measure, you can't count something if you can't tell them apart. So for example, plants that propagate with runnels or suckets, you can't sort of say, how many grass do I have? Um, so you need to use a different measure there. So, and this is the flowcharts that we've developed that are in the report that you can go and have a look at. Um, there's one for fauna, there's one for flora. Look something like this and it does look pretty daunting, I know. So I'm just going to run you quickly through an example um, of one species. So the Regent honey eater, it's a highly mobile species, um, only several hundred birds left in the wild. And our first question is um, whether or not individuals are readily detectable when they're on site. So for the Regent honey eater, this is actually true with proper surveys. Uh, at a site, we can generally detect roughly how many birds are there. So we move to our next question, which is whether the species either fluctuates substantially or isn't reliably present. Again, for the region honey eater, this is true. They might use a feeding site sporadically and they might not visit a site for long periods of time. So they're not reliably present. So we move to our final question for the honey eaters which is whether or not they already have an existing habitat school, which they don't. So we need to make a species specific, species specific scoring system for habitat quality. Note that we shouldn't here just be using the same benchmarks that we do for ecological communities. Um, just because it's a good condition, ecological community doesn't mean correspond necessarily to a good habitat for the honey eaters. Now, the guidelines that you can access will have a few of these things to consider when designing a habitat quality score. Um, I'm not going to go into this today, but feel free to have a read of it and contact either myself or my team for more details if you've got any questions. The major recommendation, however, is that you use a species specific habitat score weighted towards key features. Um, so, for example, in the example here, which is the tool that we're hoping to develop next year for um, calculating these habitat qualities. Right, so that didn't hurt so much. So we're going to do another example. We're going to go through a plant. And we're going to look at Floyd's grass. So it's a threatened New South Wales species. 
It's also the sole food source of the caterpillars for the also threatened black grass dart butterfly. Now, first question, um, Floyd's grass is easy to detect on site and the population doesn't uh, fluctuate substantially over short periods. However, our next question, individuals are easily distinguished. That's, um, that's false. It propagates with runners, so you can't tell where one grass plant ends and the next one begins, so we can't count them. Also, just measuring the area occupied isn't going to give you a good indication of how much grass you have. Species can either be a really nice, dense, lush ground cover, or if it's a poor site, it'll be a more sparse cover. So a measure of biomass and area is probably a better option. Okay, so that has given you some idea of how to count things. And so once we know what we're counting, then we need to know how many do we want to have. And for this, I'm passing you over to my colleague, Jeremy, to talk about target-based ecological compensation. Thank you, Helen. Not before I introduce him, though. Thanks so much for that. And um, exactly as Helen says, I mean, then the next step is how do we actually work out how much we want to have? Now, typically with offsetting, we need to gain as much as we lost. But um, for the reasons that I think Tita set out really clearly, often that results in maintenance of a current trajectory, which might not be where we want to get to. So Jeremy Simmons is going to talk to us about an alternative approach. Jeremy is a postdoctoral fellow here at UQ with expertise in spatial ecology and uh, conservation policy, particularly around environmental impact assessment. And he led an in international working group of people working on this problem, how to actually align the outcomes of offsetting with positive conservation targets. So this is only partly NEST funded work, but it's really relevant to a lot of the policy development and policy reform going on in different Australian offset frameworks at the moment. So thank you, Jeremy, for joining us today. No worries. Thank you, Martine. Can you uh, see me and hear me? OK. Loud and clear. OK, cool. And you can see the slides. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Martine, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, thanks to all the speakers who've preceded me. I guess to follow on with um, Megan's degustation theme, we're probably heading towards dessert now. So I hope you enjoy this. It'll be brief. Um, OK. Uh, there'll be a lot of kind of um, crossover with some of the earlier uh, material we've heard. And I'm going to dive right in here on um, a key flaw with offsetting, and this is coming out of the Samuel review from last year, um, that offsets are often poorly designed and implemented, and they tend to deliver an overall net loss for the environment. <clears throat> Again, coming out of the Samuel review and highlighted in red text here, a, a concept we've heard a lot about over the last hour or so, averted loss offsetting. The predominance of averted loss as a, as an, um, a mechanism by which to deliver offsets uh, was found in the Samuel review to lit uh, deliver little other than weak protection of remnant habitat, uh, especially sites that may never have been at risk of development. So there's clearly some fundamental issues around the, the, the inherent design of offset policy, especially where it relies on averted loss approaches. Uh, let's have a look at this averted loss and, and, and why it leads to these net loss outcomes. Uh, I, I'm sure Martin will uh, discuss this in the next presentation, but I really want to acknowledge our colleague and friend, Dr. Zoe, uh, Dr. Zoe Stone over in New Zealand, whose uh, fantastic artwork uh, features here and in all the NESP offset videos. This landscape is a, a mixed use landscape, but primarily dominated by remnant forest vegetation. We have a development project, uh, in this case, a power line uh, a transmission line. After application of the mitigation hierarchy, there's an unavoidable loss here, a residual loss. There's a clear a requirement to clear vegetation in order to, um, to construct this power line. That unavoidable loss triggers an offset and in an averted loss uh, framing, that offset would be delivered like this. Uh, of course, this is very uh, high level and illustrative. There's a lot more nuance here, but for demonstration purposes, I'm not sure if you saw, saw that, but we come in here with the fence 
So that patch of bush to the west of the power line uh, site is uh, secured as an offset. We've removed the cattle. The rationale for securing this patch of bush to the west is that we'll be securing it uh, in the long term uh, with a gain delivered uh, as a result of uh, protecting it or averting a future loss that that site may have experienced. So relative to what might have happened, this is a no net loss, a relative no net loss. But what's clear to see is that in this landscape, as we look at it here and now, there is less forest in this landscape uh, as a result of this power line project and its offset. Uh, after the, the construction of the power lines and the designation of the offset compared with before, we have a, a reduction, an absolute reduction in the amount of forest in this landscape. So that's a basic overview of, of a very simplistic overview of averted loss offsetting. Uh, this sort of outcome from a development project is not particularly consistent with the sorts of conservation targets that are increasingly prominent in um, jurisdictional, corporate uh, strategies, and certainly in international agreements around environmental protection, and specifically uh, targets that seek to uh, halt and reverse declines in uh, ecosystems and species. Targets are a big uh, topic at the moment. Of course, we, we are watching what's happening in Glasgow uh, at the COP around carbon, but uh, in parallel, we've got the Convention on Biological Diversity post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, which was uh, the feature of uh, a meeting in China a couple of weeks ago and will be agreed upon early next year. This framework is likely to embed uh, fairly explicit and a somewhat ambitious outcomes for biodiversity, uh, no more extinctions, enhancing the populations of threatened species, net gains in ecosystem extent and condition. These are time bound to 2030 and 2050 in the drafts of the, of the global biodiversity framework. These sort of outcomes that the, the um, CBD is seeking to uh, sign nations of the world up to uh, can allow for the, the derivation of targets that can inform conservation interventions on the ground. And that includes uh, conservation interventions that are delivered via biodiversity offsetting policy. So that's a bit of a background around challenges of averted loss, this notion of biodiversity targets, and how this links through specifically to what we're all here talking about today, offsetting. There are a whole exhaust, a, a huge list of questions around, uh, challenges around offsetting, but to distill it to two really key questions, for any given loss, it's really fundamental that we have a good grasp of what type and how much, um, uh, it, I'm now gonna refer to it as ecological compensation rather than offsetting, <clears throat> how much and what type of compensation is delivered for a particular unit of loss in order to achieve some sort of desirable biodiversity outcome. <clears throat> Just to reiterate, we don't want to, I guess we don't, from a conservation perspective, these sorts of ongoing uh, uh, in, entrenched declines that result from averted loss uh, are not uh, consistent with the direction that agreements like the CBD uh, are pushing towards. Okay, target-based ecological compensation. As Martin mentioned, this was a, a, a kind of a project and an idea that was co-developed by numerous uh, people, but also organizations all around the world. And it drew not just from academia, but from business, um, finance and the NGO sector. Quickly step through in a very, again, superficial way, how this uh, this concept works and, and how it's, uh, we think it represents a viable and appropriate alternative to the status quo of counterfactual based offsetting. We have a threatened species here uh, and we have a target for that species. So we've got this bird is endangered. It's conceivable that a desirable outcome, a legitimate target to aim for for this bird is that it's recovered uh, to the point that it reaches a status of least concern. Now, the establishment of targets is a whole other two hour seminar. So we just uh, accept that there's a lot of complexity in this target establishment. But in this hypothetical example, to achieve this outcome of a least concern status for this threatened species, 
the science tells us that we need to double the amount of habitat for the bird across its range. That's our target, and that's something that we can now frame and hook conservation actions towards the achievement of including ecological compensation. So to go back to our questions, our two fundamental questions, the first question around the delivery of compensation for a residual loss from a project, what type of compensation do we need to deliver? For a hypothetical example, our endangered bird where we've had a loss of habitat, it's clear that to get to the target for this species, we need gains. We need a trajectory of gain. By knowing the trajectory that's needed to achieve the desirable outcome, that tells us what sort of actions we need to do on the ground, including at our compensation site. This is where the idea of simply securing a site and protecting it from future loss becomes uh, invalidated. For a real gain in habitat for this bird or to enhance its populations, we need to undertake actions uh, that create habitat that can demonstrably increase populations. So that's through actions like uh, restoration, rehabilitation, threat abatement. Under this target-based framing, we kind of use the, the um, terminology improvement as, as a, as a catch-all for the type of um, action required. The big question is how much compensation per unit of loss. This is typically, um, I guess, in policy uh, represented by a ratio, a compensation ratio or an offset ratio. We know for this bird that the target is to double the amount of habitat. So if we go back to our hypothetical landscape and our unavoidable power line loss, imagine that that loss was 100 hectares of forest rather than an averted loss approach to um, contribute to the required net gain trajectory for this species. Uh, the proponent would need to deliver improvement actions here, the rehabilitation and restoration of forest, and the amount would be two units for every one unit lost uh, from the project. So in this case, 200 hectares as a minimum of rehabilitation, restoration for the 100 hectares of loss. Here in this uh, example, the project has uh, 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 has an overall outcome of a, a doubling of the habitat uh, in this landscape within the, the bounds of its specific operations. This doubling of habitat is a proportionate contribution to the overarching conservation target for this species. We've got a really straightforward um, Microsoft Excel calculator to help um, determine these improvement or uh, other uh, compensation ratios that's available as part of the package of materials that I think um, Tim has been sharing links for. To summarize this approach, target-based ecological compensation, and uh, forgive me for the simplicity of the examples today, but just in the interest of time, kept it very high level. Please reach out to myself, uh, Martin. There's a huge um, team behind this. And so if there's any questions or concerns, please let us know. We think that this approach helps to clarify the division of responsibility amongst actors. It embeds transparency. The, the, uh, the proponent of the development can uh, provide compensation and it's a clearly uh, defensible uh, uh, methodology for, for those key questions of what type and how much, where it's linked to that conservation target. Uh, I've basically said that second point by virtue of these, um, the framing and the what type and how much with the overarching target, it simplifies determination of compensation requirements and it can help business uh, to contribute good outcomes, to contribute towards good outcomes. But I guess the very key uh, uh, counterpoints to those uh, positives, and Megan's mentioned these earlier. We reiterate um, that compensation should be a, an option of absolute last resort, the fourth and final step of the mitigation hierarchy after rigorous implementation of the first three steps. And specifically thinking about um, improvement, restoration and rehabilitation, there are gonna be a lot of instances where uh, for all manner of reasons, be they ecological, uh, uh, tenure, social governance, all manner of reasons where delivering with a, a high degree of certainty uh, improvement is uh, is constrained. 
and that really puts into question the, the validity and the appropriateness of undertaking compensation. Resources, there's, there's a, a, a paper that describes this method in detail, fact sheet produced by the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. Martin's about to introduce the videos. And so I thank you for your time and I hope that's of, of interest and use. And I'm going to be quick, um, even though I don't want to be, because I just I just love um, this little video series that I just want to put in a plug for. So I don't know if Zoe is still on the line, but this is really um, very much um, the work of Zoe Stone in terms of the interpretation and, and the artistic rendering um, of these videos. Um, Essentially, this came about because so this was part of the synthesis project that we did under the hub, where essentially we've been talking about a lot of tricky concepts here today. Um, a lot of the distinctions that we're talking about seem really subtle or even academic, but they actually aren't. They are they make a big difference to the outcome you get in the real world, depending on which way you go. And so because of that, it's really important to have really clear understanding of the implications of different decision, decisions and judgments that you might make in designing an offsets policy or implementing an offset. And so we thought a really good way to show this um, would be to develop like a little a, a series of animations um, that sort of demonstrate these key concepts, you know, a video per key concept. Um, stepping through some of the issues, explaining why each one's important and what the consequences are, um, depending on, on how these sort of concepts are interpreted. And so um, a, a crew of us wrote a series of scripts to sort of outline these issues. And there's now, um, it's grown into a series of nine short videos um, from about you know, four to about seven minutes long um, on just introducing the concept of offsetting, why we do offsetting, so what sort of triggers um, we might be responding to, what we offset, how do we decide what the units are and, and what this, whether we're talking about species, ecosystems, um, uh, how, how do we measure those, those units, so related to the sort of thing that Helen was talking about, how do we actually calculate the amount of loss and the amount of gain so that they're comparable and um, not overestimating our expectation of gain, as, as Megan described. How do we factor in all these tricky things like the uncertainty that we've been talking about, um, the time delay between um, an impact and an offset uh, being effective, and the sort of multipliers we might use to reflect these sorts of things. The rules around offsetting. So rules are things like you can trade um, losses and gains within a broad vegetation group, um, but not from one broad vegetation group to another. So these are the rules that sit around the calculations. What are the implications of those? Strategic offsets. How can we be spatially strategic and what are the sorts of considerations that, that come into that? Target-based ecological co compensation, which Jeremy has just described, and it's a really nifty little video there. And monitoring and evaluation of offsets. How do we know they're working? Now, I, I believe that the sound doesn't work. I can hear it, but apparently you can't, but that's good because the, the only tragedy about this video series is that in the end, I did most of the voiceovers. So I apologise um, for those who might want to listen to them rather than just look at them. But if you do look at them, you can see this amazing artwork, this original artwork by Zoe Stone. And it's not just the artwork she did, like the full interpretation of the words that we put on paper was basically um, Zoe's um, uh, initiative. And I think it's pretty amazing. So hopefully you can at least see some of that animation working out to get a, a flavour of these, of these videos and how they go. So because we don't have the sound, I'm going to move on. I just want to point out that um, one of the really nice things about this NEST project is that, I mean, these, these concepts, they're not just specific to the Australian situation. Um, they are generically um, uh, important concepts for offsetting wherever it's implemented worldwide. And we've been able to get these videos out through um, uh, a new group that several of us have formed under the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, under the Commission for Ecosystem Management. So this new group is called the Thematic Group on Impact Mitigation and Ecological Compensation, IMEC. And I know there's a lot of IMEC members online right now. And so we have um, links to our um, new official website through the IUCN website, and you can get all of the videos there, but I believe Doors also put them online as well. And I'll put some links here. This will all be circulated so you can access all of this. Um, but you can see uh, if you're interested to join that um, IMET group, you can sign up through the Commission's portal 
um, to become a member of the um, Commission on Ecos Ecosystem Management and then select our group as one that you'd like to join. Now, because um, the end of the, the last four year period of the IUCN sort of commissions has just wrapped up, you may not be able to do this right now, but I understand within a week or so that will open back up again for membership. And if you have been a member, uh, you have an opportunity to renew your membership. Um, and I think that's available right now if you go to the commissions portal. So um, uh, we'll share um, these resources, we'll share the links to all these amazing videos um, and um, all of the slides from today as well. And all of the products we've talked about and a lot more are available at these two links. Again, we're going to share this with everybody in a package following up from this webinar. But um, before we wrap things up, I want to use this um, last opportunity for questions and I'll just unshare my screen so I can see if people have hands up um, now because I know that we had a lot of questions that we were trying to make up time by answering as we went. If you put a question in the chat and we didn't get to it or we didn't get to it satisfactorily, please put your hand up or put another question um, up there so that we can that we can catch up and good to see some discussion continuing. And just remember that, um, again, the idea is for you to let us know if you want to have a chat offline at another date um, or with your agency about any or all of these sorts of topics. Really keen to um, provide a more in-depth briefing or to you know, discuss how they might be applicable to any particular policy or implementation context 